So thank you everyone for coming. I'm Jen Knudsen. Um, I'm the assistant director at the University of South Alabama Archaeology Museum. Uh, we're celebrating our, our 10th anniversary this year. Admission is free, um, so please come visit us. We have um, uh, 14,000 years of artifacts um, done in over 50 years of South Alabama archaeology. Uh, we've done 50 year, uh, I'm sorry, over 1,300 projects on the Gulf Coast in that time. Uh, so tonight, uh, I'm talking about some of my pirate research, um, and I'm going to introduce you to some, some characters, and I was interested in, uh -oh. I was interested in, The um, early pirates, um, well before the age of piracy, and um, so I'm going to introduce you to some of those, including um, one that we still see today depicted in popular culture, although you may not realize it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start while we get this set up. Um, so there were. There were economically vibrant maritime centers for French Protestant that were established early during the course of the 16th century. And they set precedents for a frequent occurrence of Huguenot um, corsairing. And so what is a Huguenot um, or a Huguenot? A Huguenot is a, is a French Protestant and they were um, Calvinists. But they actually start um, their pirating activities before they become Protestants. Um, and so they, they uh, have these Norman uh, port cities um, on the uh, western coast across from the English Channel, especially Dieppe, Rouen, Le Havre, La Rochelle. Um, and in 1523, so we're going way back, the um, French knowledge of the Spanish treasure fleets was sent quickly throughout the country um, when uh, two of three Spanish caravels were pirated off the coast of Portugal. And they were weighted with tons of Cortez's treasure um, from Mexico, of which French captain Jean Fleury um, relieved their burden. Um, another source the same year credit Jean Anjou, Anjou of Dieppe was stealing from these fleets in the Azores. And so um, raw materials and pillage treasure entered from these ports in France and from the beginnings of the New World exploration. And so, um, Paul Hoffman estimates that from 1535 to 1547, that French corsairs took over 60 Spanish ships and attacked 17 Spanish colonial towns. Over half the ships were um, off the Spanish coast as they reached their voyage in. So they were coming up to Spain and the French were getting them right before they got there. And, um, and then in 1548 to 1563, it increased to nearly 90 ship prizes and over 40 sieges by land. Um, I'm not reading this, this paper um, per se, but the first um, French pirate I want to introduce you to is Jacques de Sore. Um, and during the summer of 1555, and, and by this time, the Huguenots are the Huguenots are Huguenots. They're Protestants. Um, they've used some of their wealth to to buy titles in um, in France, and and they've become a merchant a merchant class. Um, so they're operating with royal letters of mark. And Captain Jacques Sore sacked the port of Havana, committed various atrocities defiled the church and killed a number of Spanish subjects. Um, and there are some accounts of his whereabouts again in 1559 and 1571. Um, he was questioned in 1559 by the Admiral of France, who I'm going to talk about in, in just a moment, who is um, Admiral Colin Guy. And um, he was concerned Suarez was equipping to pirate in West Indies. And Colombi Columbia stated that Suarez was not. However, Huguenot-fronted colonies, which Admiral Coligny was a Huguenot, were in the 
works. So they are definitely working together. Um, and in 1571, um, a document from the archives in Sevilla uh, says this. I had noticed that a French ship 19 days ago that came from Dieppe and Canaria ran across Captain Soré with 34 or 36 sailors and another 11 who were 10 leagues away. There was a big storm that lasted two days and we stopped to refresh. I sent an advisor to the certified Admiral in Huguenot. He weighed Condé's resolution to have the Armada going out to steal, that to remove him from this determination and to guard them from other designs that you must have done. Um, and so with this, I, I leave and share my belief with you. Um, and that is um, from Spain about Soré. Um, so little is known about Jacques de Soré. That's about all we know, but we also know, thank you. Um, about another uh, French corsair named Francois Leclerc, and he's my favorite. He was retired with a patent in one of the lower orders of nobility. So he has, um, you know, he's, he's gotten some money, um, and Leclerc was issued one of the first letters of mark and 10 ships to patrol Caribbean waters by um, Henri II in 1553. And he, he did, um, Jacques de Soré had served under Leclerc, and together they, plund they plundered um, Puerto Prince, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and their force numbered 300 men and eight ships in their 30 day assault on Cuba. Leclerc um, and, and uh, Leclerc and Soré passed their naval expertise to other Cuban corsairs. And furthermore, Leclerc significantly terrorized the Spanish, and this is why he's my favorite, and this is why he's still in popular culture. He was known as Pan de Bois and P de Palo in Spanish, both of which mean peg leg. So that's where he comes from, and that seals his uh, remembrance to history, whether we realize it or not. Um, so as the Huguenots are on, on the Norman coast of France, I just saw your pirate costume. Thank you for that. Uh, they are they're 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 trading with the English, right? They're a merchant class, they're trading across the channel, and they're trading Bibles, and and that is so they're influencing the English Protestants in that sense, and um, they're uniting against Catholic, the Catholics. And in 1559, Philip II said. Uh, see that the said peace is observed on our part. Because as you know, in peacetime, we are accustomed to having corsairs going to rob against the will of their prince. It is well said that during this time, the ships that come from that area do not come unprepared. So um, it's well known. These French pirates are well known. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is Admiral Coligny. And I did my undergraduate degree at the University of North Florida in Jacksonville, Florida. And that's where I first became interested in the Huguenots. And they, um, they settled uh, Fort Caroline in 1565. And like I said before, Admiral Coligny was the Admiral of, of France. Um, and he ordered and, and per, you know, directed these expeditions um, and on those expeditions, there were uh, several mutinies. Um, they settled first in Charles Fort, which is Paris Island, and that didn't work out, so they went to Fort Caroline in Jacksonville, Florida in 1564. And those had three, Fort Caroline had three mutinies, and um, of the men stationed there, and they were out running around um, pirating. So they escape from Fort Caroline and they're going around pirating. They actually do get caught by the Spanish. Um, and Captain Jean Rabot is a very interesting character um, because he actually worked for Queen Elizabeth in the English Navy for a while. So I always wonder about him um, if he is uh, doing any spy craft as well between the English and the French. Um, and René de Lovenaire, he, he led the Fort Caroline expedition 
Um, and he was the one who they all mutinied against because he wasn't a, a bad captain, but he, they said he was neglectful. Um, the French at the fort, they didn't want to eat um, certain foods that they had plenty of for some reason, like fish, and they would always complain that they were starving. Um, he did, so Rabot did leak, uh, secretly leak reports when he worked for um, the English Navy. Um, and Queen Elizabeth, he actually left Fort Caroline and then came back, but he came back too late because Queen Elizabeth had thrown him in the tower for a little bit. She was done with him. Um, so this is one of the testimonies from one of the mutineers um, when he was being questioned by the Spanish. So um, he said, uh, it was common knowledge, it's common knowledge that the French will pirate um, in the Atlantic coast. Um, and the last one I'm gonna talk about, just to make this short and sweet. So what happens to Fort Colangy is he is actually the first person who was um, murdered during um, St. Bart's massacre, which um, the, the river Seine flowed red with blood in Paris. There were over 5,000 Huguenots massacred. Um, and this happens at the wedding of um, Henri II, the King of Navarre, who would later become the Protestant King of France, although he said um, he converted to Catholicism before he became king. He said Paris is always worth a mass. Um, but Coligny was uh, shot, knifed, hung, quartered, <laughs> drugged, drowned. Um, they did everything to him. Um, and then they went after the other French nobles. Um, The last one I'm going to talk about is Francis Drake. Now we all know Francis Drake, um, and he is an English pirate, but what a lot of people don't know about Drake is that um, he worked with the Huguenots, and he would get them in his designs. So he planned the theft of the Spanish fleet that ultimately profited him in excess of a thousand pounds in gold coins and silver. Um, French Corsairs, who, as, who assisted the raid, also received their shares um, in addition to, they had Cimarrones that helped them as well. Um, and so the Huguenot that was leading under Drake is Guillaume Le Testu, and he led a crew of 30 who left from Le Havre. Upon the rendezvous with Drake in the West Indies, he told Drake of the incover, incoming transfer of a treasure by mule train, mule train at Nombre de Dios in Panama. And so, Latestu, not only was he an Atlantic navigator, he was also a royal cartographer. So he dedicated his most well-known work, interestingly, interestingly enough, to uh, Admiral Colingi. And this is his most famous atlas titled um, uh, Cosmography Universalis Salon de Navigators um, from Ancient Times to Modern Times. Um, and it has a lot of imagery which also appears in what's called the Drake Manuscript. And the Drake Manuscript has the sacking of Nombre de Dios in Panama in it. Um, The Drake manuscript, it is unknown who the author is, but it is thought to be of Huguenot origin due to its similarities to Le Testu's document. Um, I have this picture because we see these in museums all the time, on museums all over the world. If you're talking about Native Americans and um, contact um, in Florida, um, and this, they are from, uh, they are from Fort Caroline in Jacksonville um, after one of the, um, who was also, he was the cartographer for that expedition. Um, and he made illustrations while he was there. Um, and so we do see these reproduced. He escaped when the Spanish attacked the fort. Um, and uh, a famous bookmaker, Theodore de Bry, is said to have bought them from his widow. So if you see these black and white, they're woodcut engravings. 
Um, we even have one at the Archaeology Museum in one of our exhibits. Um, and we have um, some originals, too, on the wall. Um, that's what they're from. So I've hardly ever seen credited, so I wanted to include that. Um, I have some sources here, but to sum up, um, by 1685, Protestants, no matter their nationality, were absolutely banned from Spanish colonies in the West Indies. And the Huguenot network pursued a broad sphere of influence in order to find support for their belief system, find money for their lands, and to build wealth. And they did this all, I would argue, while arresting the dominion of Spain in the New World, because Spain could have done so much more if it hadn't been for the Huguenots um, putting thorns in their side along the way. organization, but we also assist the state of Florida, the Division of Historical Resources, with any projects or with any issues that they might have or need from us. We also assist local governments with all sorts of needs that, that they might have as well. Uh, but, but I'd say like 90% of what we do is public outreach uh, and education. So, all right, let me, let me do this the slow way. You guys want to hear about underwater archaeology? <laughs> <laughs> I do have a little bit of that in here. There it is. Okay, great. So that was my spiel for FPAN, the Florida Public Archaeology Network. We have a website, fpan.us. We do all sorts of programs. I know this is mobile, but we're not too far. We're about an hour from you all. Um, so we have a lot going on. We also have a, a museum uh, at our coordinating center called the Destination Archaeology Resource Center. And that's sort of like my main title is I manage that museum and I do a lot of different programs out of that museum. Um, but we're open, we're free, we're open uh, Wednesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We have all sorts of different artifacts that have been located throughout the entire state of Florida, going back to the earliest occupation 14,000 years ago, up to more recent uh, artifacts, both from on land as well as underwater sites. So please come check us out. We also have a public archaeology lab that's open to the public. So if you want to volunteer some time, we have a lab that you can actually come in and help process artifacts that archaeologists find kind of in the Pensacola, Northwest Florida area. So lots of stuff for you to do. But today I'm here to talk about pirates. And like I said, we're skipping ahead. We're skipping way ahead from where Jen left off in the early 1600s, 1500s. Um, uh, you know, I've been giving this talk for a number of years. I call it Pirates, the Last Scourge of the Gulf. And the reason why I call it that is because it's really the last time that there was any major pirate activity in what's now the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. And that actually took place um, about 100 years after a period of time in which most people are probably more familiar with when you talk about pirates. And so when I say uh, pirates, usually people will talk about figures. What are some famous pirate figures that you might have heard of, other than the ones Jen mentioned? Just Jean Lafitte. Jean Lafitte, that's later. That's good. We're, you're, we're in the right time period. Yeah. How about someone else? Who? Captain Kidd. Captain Kidd, that's a good one. Blackbeard. Blackbeard. That, or teach, I got a good friend of mine, Bayless Brooks. 
you want to know anything about Blackbeard, read Bayless Brooks' uh, work. He's done a lot of really interesting genealogical information uh, about Blackbeard, which is really fascinating. So, but the, the ones that people are mentioning, Anne Bonny, Mary Reed, right? Uh, all these people, they are from the golden age of piracy. It was what historians refer to as this time period that kind of fluctuates in time, but most historians agree that it dates to about 1680 up to about 1720. And why does it end in 1720? Well, it's because they have to pick a date for it to end, basically. So that's why they pick it. Uh, so that's, that's known as the golden age of piracy. That's, this is the period in which those figures are more familiar with. The, the time period that I have focused the last 10 years or so of my research on takes place 100 years later, a little bit after the feet, a little bit after the feet, but kind of leading up into his time period. So that's why I, I call it the last scourge of the golf. Um, this actually all started. Uh, Again, like I said, about 10 years ago, I, I was working for a museum at the time, and uh, it was a little community uh, on the Gulf Coast uh, in the Florida Panhandle called Fort Walton Beach, Florida, which I always like to joke, there was never a fort there, and there's not a beach there. Hmm. It's just the truth, right? Uh, but what Fort Walton Beach is mainly known for is a pirate festival. In fact, it's the second, they claim, the second oldest pirate festival in the state of Florida, uh, right behind Gasparilla, which takes place in Tampa. It's a little over 100 years old that has been going on. But they celebrate this pirate festival. It's called the Billy Bullock's Pirate Festival. And there's a local legend that there was a pirate who operated in the area. And his name was Billy Bullock, and he buried treasure. And it's all the sort of stereotypes that you hear from pirate stories. Uh, and so we, we were doing an exhibit. We wanted to kind of examine this, this figure and see if there's any truth. And I, I, whenever I give this talk, I have to get ready to duck because I'm afraid that people will throw like rotten <laughs> food at me. But the truth of the matter is, Billy Bowlegs was not a historical figure. His fiction is made up for tourism. But in doing the research for this exhibit, I came across this interesting case of piracy that wound up in the District Court of West Florida in 1823. And I thought to myself, what is going on here? 1820s that there's a case of piracy in Pensacola. There's like 800 people live there in Pensacola. It's a small little kind of, you know, borderlands town. And so I started digging into this. And so I was trained, my background, I was actually trained as a historian, even though I've been doing public archaeology for almost two decades now. But my background, you know, my, both my undergrad and my master's are in history. And I was trained in maritime history. I just, uh, uh, Age of Revolution is the time period that I mainly focus on. So as a historian, I was like, let's look at the documents. So I ended up going to archives and libraries, all sorts of places. I, I went to DC to find the original log books of some of these naval ships that were actually trying to, uh, that actually had captured this ship uh, off the coast of Cuba in 1822 and then brought it into court in the West Florida. Uh, I went to the local archives. There's uh, Scandia uh, County Clerk of Court, they have an archives. All the federal, if there was a federal court that was located in Pensacola, there was one in Mobile, there was one in New Orleans, there were several others as well. Uh, but all their records are actually in Pensacola for those federal court cases, and you can actually view those. So I went to local records, and I found this, this wealth of information, just tons of information from the, from the ninth, early 19th uh, century about what happened in this case. Court records. Sometimes court records are like you just get the minute books, so it's like a paragraph of like what happened, and that's all you get. And then when you go to see if there's any file, there's literally nothing in the file because the judge decided that they didn't need to write any of this stuff down. So you would just end up with that. Other times you'll find uh, files that have literally a thousand pages of documents from one case because it's been appealed so many times, right? So kind of mixed bag. Letters from officials, uh, from, from merchants, from insurance companies, newspapers accounts, especially in the early uh, 1800s, there's tons of newspaper accounts about this stuff. Ship logs and diaries, government reports, memoirs, autobiographies, people publishing about you know, their experience of being attacked by a pirate or maybe even being accused of piracy and trying to you know, exonerate their name by writing a book about it. I'm sure they made some money off that as well. But there's just tons of documents. Now, as a historian, we're taught that the most important type of information we can get is called a primary document. So these are documents that were created in the time period that we're studying. So uh, if George Washington wrote a letter to Martha, that's a primary doctorate, uh, document, and we give, that, uh, we give that a lot of value because it took place in that time period. So we're, we're getting that 
eyewitness, firsthand account. Whereas secondary sources are things like history books written 100 years later, right? So we don't assign as much value to those, although they are certainly valuable sources. But there's a problem with all these documents, especially when we're talking about pirates. Um, and I didn't know, I don't know if you all know this or not, but it turns out that pirates were not the best record keepers. <laughs> They're not the best record keepers. Why, right? It kind of makes sense. You don't want to write down all your crimes because <laughs> then guess what they're gonna use in court against you? Everything you wrote down, they're gonna use that 100%, 100%. So uh, we don't actually have a lot of documentation from these pirates uh, themselves, from this, from this time period anyways. Most of what we have, a uh, vast majority of it, comes from people who were, did, didn't know them like pirates, right? They, it was the naval officers trying to capture them, it was the uh, governors who sometimes had relationships with them, but sometimes those relationships soured and they wanted to you know, get rid of them. So there's, there's inherent biases in any sort of primary document. And this, this certainly applies to pirates, pirates, but it applies to other groups as well. Uh, like children, for example. Uh, like women for a very long time. Uh, like uh, people of African descent who were enslaved. They, they didn't have the same opportunities to create these documents that historians now use to tell the stories of the past. So that, that is a bias, and that's a, that's a problem. And that's why archeology span is, is so important, whether we're studying enslaved people, or children, or women in the past, uh, but also pirates who also did not necessarily leave behind much of a written record. Um, I love this quote, I attribute it to Dr. Judy Bench because I heard her say it first, Maybe she heard it from somewhere else, but that's who I heard it from, so I attribute her. Uh, Dr. Benz is an archaeologist. She founded uh, the university's archaeology program at the University of West Florida. She founded FPAN. She was university president. She does lots of things. But she had this great quote that I've heard her say many times. She said, archaeology is great because it tells you what people were really doing, not what they just said they were doing. So archaeology is the, the physical remains of what happened in the past. And you can kind of think of it as like a crime scene, right? So if you have a, a murder or some crime that's committed, uh, you have sometimes you'll have witness testimony, and they'll use that in court. And unless someone actually saw it happen, then it's called hearsay and it's not admissible, right? So what you want is a witness that actually saw it happen. But a lot of times when you look at these cases, um, you have witnesses that saw the same incident that say very different things. And that's why the physical evidence is so important when you look at these modern court cases and trials is because the physical evidence doesn't lie. The physical evidence tells the truth. And that's where archaeology in, in this context can really help us tell a lot of information about these individuals in the past who may have not, for whatever various reasons, left behind much historical record. Shipwrecks are usually what people think when they think of pirates, pirate shipwrecks. There are a few pirate wrecks that have been confirmed, and those all date from uh, basically golden age time period, so there's the Widda, right, off, off the, that's off the Atlantic coast. Uh, and there's their Queen Anne's Revenge, that was Blackbeard's flagship, that's off the coast of North Carolina. Those two have been confirmed after many, many years of archaeology being done on them. Um, but there are potential shipwrecks out there that may also be from pirate wrecks that, that we can use this to kind of help tell that story. Shipwrecks are important. There's also, uh, you know, pirates also use the land, they didn't just hang out on ships all the time. So there, there is also some. Uh, potential for archaeology of piracy on land. And some scholars have actually done a lot of work on that. But for now, we're going to talk about shipwrecks. Shipwrecks are great because of two main things, and that is because of close context and excellent preservation. So, um, close context is really important in archaeology. Context is basically the relationship artifacts have to each other in the same layer. So, and so with a shipwreck, it's almost like a time capsule. When that ship sunk, for whatever reason, when we find it archaeologically, unless it's been disturbed, uh, that is that one moment in time that we're seeing on the ground, the physical remains of it. This is a shipwreck that's in the Gulf of Mexico. It's about a mile down. It's uh, several, several, uh, 30 or 40 miles off the coast of Texas. Its, uh, it's, it's uh, official name is Monterey Shipwreck A, okay, because they don't know the identity of this wreck. But uh, the, the best guess right now is that it may be a pirate ship or a privateer ship from the 1820s, which to me is really interesting because that's the time period that I mostly focused on. But the, the, the context of this ship is really what makes it important in terms of the information that we can gather from it, if it turns out to actually be a privateer ship, or if it's just any other shipwreck 
That's really important. The other thing that's great about shipwrecks is a preservation. This is from that same shipwreck. That is a book on the bottom seat. Uh, like I said, it's a mile down. Uh, you wouldn't think that underwater conditions would preserve things very well, but they actually are excellent at preserving organic materials. Um, so they actually did not attempt to try to bring this up because they were worried about bringing it that. It's so deep that they have to use a remotely operated vehicle to get to it. Divers can't get down that far. Uh, and so they were worried about transporting it up back a mile. Uh, so they left it in place. But it's been there for over 200 years. You know, maybe they'll have some technology in the future to be able to excavate it safely. But there's a lot of information that we can learn from shipwrecks. The time period that I study really looks at this, the age of revolution, 1775, so American Revolutionary War. Going to 1826, I've actually, I need to uh, update this. It's now going up to 1828. I got a paper I'm giving tomorrow about another case of piracy that came to Pensacola in 1828, or 1829. That's, so I had to extend that a little bit. But really, uh, most, most of the times if you look at the age of revolutions, it's this date that historians give you. Piracy was very rampant during this time period. One historian described this time period as maritime mayhem in the Gulf and the uh, Caribbean. Um, this is a typical, I think, ship that people think of when you think of pirate ship, this schooner, two massive schooner, of course. What's the name of that flag? Jolly Roger. Jolly Roger, right? The, the black flag with the skull and crossbones, or sometimes a dagger through the heart, or a pistol, or all sorts of things that meant terror and meant to be scary, so you give up your ship so they don't have to fight you, right? Um, in this time period, uh, they are still using black flags, but more commonly what we're seeing is that pirate ships during this period actually were flying these red flags, these bloody red flags. And basically what that meant was that no quarter would be given uh, if, you, if you didn't just give up and give them everything off your ship. But more, much more commonly uh, throughout the early 1800s and the 1820s. In fact, there's even a, a, that court case that I looked at, the commander, the captain of the, the naval vessel that captured this alleged pirate um, wrote the, uh, the attorney in New Orleans and said, we found a bloody red flag, like, use this as evidence in court, right? So, more commonly that. This is one of my favorite pirate flags. Uh, like I said, there's not a real figure called Billy Bowling, but there was a real guy named William Augustus Bowles who was not Fort Long Beach. He was uh, a couple hundred miles to the east of that along the Apalachicola River, but this was his flag. And I love it because it's like mixing those two things, right? You've got the black, you got the red. Instead of the skull, you've got the sun. And you've got, instead of the, the skull and the crossbones, you've got these uh, spy glasses crossed. So it's like, he's kind of like winking that he's a pirate. But he's like actually claiming he's a privateer or a, like a legalized pirate. Um, so the, the, the time period I study again, 1820s, uh, a lot of the research that I end up doing is, also, is mainly through naval records and court cases, because that's where most of the documents are at. Um, it, it got so bad in the 1820s that in 1819, the United States Congress actually created an entire squadron of naval ships to deal with this problem. The British also had a whole squadron specifically established to deal with both anti-pirate patrols as well as anti-slave trade patrol patrols because uh, in 1807 and in 1808, both the United States and Great Britain had outlawed the transatlantic slave trade, but then they had to actually enforce it with naval ships. So the British, for their part in Jamaica, they had the Jamaica Squadron, and that's what their anti-pirate patrol was, was located at. Uh, and then the Americans uh, had a, another squadron called the West Indies Squadron, which originally was located at uh, Thompson's Island, it's what we call Key West today. But eventually, uh, by 1825, 1826, they actually moved West Indies Squadron. Does anyone want to guess what they moved it to? It's where I'm from. <laughs> Pensacola. They actually moved West Indies Squadron to Pensacola, Florida in 1826, and they operated out of there. And that is actually why Pensacola NAS is there today. It's because of the West Indies Squadron. It's because of this anti-pirate squadron. Um, so they had a huge squadron of vessels. Uh, I like this. This is an image um, that was created. It's supposed to be some war U.S. warships located off the coast of Puerto Rico uh, in 1825 or six, I believe. But it's the uh, uh, I think I have this right. It's USS um, Congress, USS Beagle, and USS Grumpus, and all three of those ships were regularly in Pensacola because that's where the West Indies station was at. Uh, but very quickly, the naval patrols over a few years, they really cracked down on pirates, uh, and pirates really didn't stand much of a chance against a full naval force 
especially when they're dealing with both the British Navy as well as the American Navy. So very quickly, piracy kind of wound up. And I'm not going to do this full presentation because I think I'm pretty much out of time. But I did want to touch on a couple things because I know we're using some terminology that probably most of you are familiar with, but just in case you're not, just to give you some definitions. Um, so there was a legal difference between piracy, which is the unlawful taking of a privately owned ship vessel by, an by another, and then privateering, which had really existed since the 1500s, and basically a state sponsor would give permission to a privately armed ship to attack merchant vessels of a country that they were at war with at the time. So it was a legal document that laid out a whole bunch of stipulations, but in essence, it, it legalized this otherwise illegal activity. Um, the reality is, it turns out, it's incredibly hard to regulate piracy. It's very difficult. And so by 1850s, they finally gave up on it. Uh, but but it, was a, it was a thing that most um, uh, European powers engaged in pretty regularly. Uh, I love this quote it's from Lucretia Parker. She was cap captured by pirates in Cuba in 1821. She said, uh, when she described her captors, she said, they're a motley crew of desperados. Um, and they were certainly, in her case, incredibly violent. Uh, they actually killed most of the people that were on board the ship that she was part of when they, when they captured. But the motley crew is actually very, very accurate. So some, in some cases, we know pirates could be incredibly violent. In other cases that I've seen, it kind of varies, right? Other times, they almost are like polite when they're robbing them. It's very interesting. Uh, but Motley Cruz is definitely the, the common theme that I see throughout this period. And what she meant was that it was an international crew. And so when you look at crews like the Feats crew uh, or, or any of these other crews from Cuba or South America, you find that they were incredibly diverse. And we know in North America, some historians have done research that found a fifth of one fifth of all mariners who were operating out of US ports were people of African descent, both free as well as enslaved. So these were incredibly diverse crews. Uh, but again, privateering was, was, had been a thing for quite a while. I'll just give a couple examples. This is from uh, Continental Congress. So we had a lot of privateers that we uh, gave commissions to during the American Revolutionary War. Um, this is just one example. We also did that during the War of 1812. Pretty, the British did as well. Uh, this is another one. This is a British privateer commission. And they're all written by lawyers, so the language is very similar, right? It's like, you want to know the name of the ship, like how many guys are on it, how many guns you have, how many tons it weighs, and then it laid out like all these different rules, like you can't like, you know, beat the crew that you capture, it. you gotta bring the ship into an actual prize port in the country that's sponsoring you through that commission. So it lays out all the rules, but in reality, sometimes these guys just didn't follow that. I mean, it was just easier to, to break the rules sometimes. But this is a, a British one, this is from the Vice Admiralty Court. And this is one from the Republic of Mexico. This is from Louis Ari who was one of Lafitte's um, uh, companions, uh, who, was, who was also notorious as a, a slave trader, an illegal slave trader, as was Lafitte and his brother Pierre. They were both, uh, you know, they're often regarded as you know, being these heroes of the War of 1812, but they should really be more known for their involvement in the illicit slave trade. And I think I'll, I think I'll just end with that, because I know we, we still have, this is supposed to be a chat, so we can chat about anything else. And, and I'm sure like, hopefully we'll have questions and hopefully we've, we've not covered everything so you'll actually have some questions. So, if that sounds good, I'll just stop there. And I've got pictures of other shipwrecks that I can show if you, if you want to see those later, so. Great, so, do we want to do questions or how do, how do we want to? Right on time, you got a timer, that's perfect. <laughs> So I noticed you weren't using the term the letter of mark. Yeah. Is, is, is there a reason? Yeah, because there's a difference. Okay. So a letter of mark was um, slightly different than what's later by the 19th century referred to as a commission. Okay. So a letter of mark really was designed for a merchant ship that was still primarily acting as a merchant ship, but may have been armed to some extent, and then if the opportunity came for them to like deal another merchant ship that they would do it, but they were primarily still functioning as a merchant vessel. A privateer with a commission was not a merchant at all. Mm -hmm. It was a privately armed ship for war. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the distinction, that's the difference. And, and it's more, you, know, you see a letter of marks and reprisals earlier on, like Golden Age and during the Buccaneering time period, and probably even earlier than that, the 1500s, uh, with the Elizabethan age. Um, but by the 19th century, this age of revolutions, is, it's usually called a commission. Yeah, good question. When they captured a ship, did they, what did they do typically with the sailors on the other ship or the passengers? Did they kill them or sell them into slavery or what did they do? I would say uh, there was no typical. You know, <laughs> I've seen such, and you, you've probably seen this too, there's such variation. On what, when we're talking about a privateer ship, there was a specific set of rules that they're supposed to follow, right? So. Generally speaking, they, they wouldn't abuse the crew. Uh, usually what would happen is once they had captured a, a vessel, if they wanted to keep it, they would send a, what they called a prize crew on board that ship, and they would then take it into a port where they could go through the legal process to, to have it go, make sure, they had to go through a whole legal process. A court had to actually look at the case and say like, yes, this was a legal capture, or no, it wasn't, and then sort that out. In some cases I've seen where you had just you know, straight up pirates that didn't care about a commission or their commission had expired and they were like, I don't care that it's expired, we're going to continue. I've, I've seen the gamut. I've seen everything from, yeah, they killed everybody on board or tried to. And I've seen them like look at the cargo and be like, yeah, it's not really worth it. Have a nice day. See you later. So, so you know, it's, it's really hard. And sometimes, it, you know, a lot of times you'll, we, when we like to do that as historians and archaeologists, we like to generalize. But I think there's... There's so much variability in, in what actually happened that um, it's it's hard to be like this. This always is the case. I mean, there's like an ideal what should happen, but that wasn't always the case. Okay. <laughs> you want to you want anything to add? I would say that um, in the case of the the French and the Spanish, um, most of the time they showed no mercy um, because not only is it it's also this Protestantism versus Catholicism too. Um, in the case of, of the Spanish, um, Rabo actually was shipwrecked by a hurricane with the Spanish Pedro Menendez behind him. And when they found him on shore, they slaughtered 400 Frenchmen. Now, if they would convert to Catholicism, they wouldn't have been slaughtered. So a few did survive. And then the mutineers, um, when it served the purposes of of the country that caught them, you know, they were able to take them to court and give testimony and really promote the idea that, you know, this is what the French are doing, here's the record. So it, it just depends on, it, it just depends, yeah. And I would say, that, that just to kind of add to that, and again, I'm talking mainly, you know, late 18th, early 19th century, when you look at, like, enslaved people, for example, uh, oftentimes these pirates were, were involved in selling these people and specifically targeting slave ships off the coast of West Africa. There's a real well-known case and a shipwreck down in the Florida Keys called the Guerrero. Uh, and I think it dates from 1828 or 1829. But in that case, this group of pirates had actually sailed to the coast of Africa specifically looking for slave ships that they, they would then capture and then, then take those cargo uh, in this case, they were trying to get to Cuba to sell those individuals there, and it ended in, in really a disaster. Uh, and the, the vessel eventually wrecked. Several of the uh, captives, unfortunately, perished. They actually drowned at the site. So, you know, if they find the site, it is it is a burial site today. Um, but but that's something that and even in the Golden Age, like Blackbeard was involved in the slave trade. I mean, that's that was also part of it. And so, in those cases, it's it's common to see them. Uh, be involved in that activity, based when on my research. When the humans were the cargo. Yes, yes, exactly. In some cases, they would, you know, people would join the pirate ships. I mean, that is something that you see pretty commonly. Um, those are interesting, too, because, you know, if they're caught, then you usually have, like, one or two of the crew members are like, they forced me against my will to serve as the pilot, you know, or the navigator, or the surgeon, some specialized, um, uh, you know, job that, that they couldn't just get from some ordinary sailor when they needed special knowledge like that. But and oftentimes you'll see them kind of like distance themselves if they're caught. Um, so we do know that sometimes they join willingly, and then sometimes they might have actually been forced against their will if you know there was a need for them. 
And ship pilots were often, the, they were the ones who escaped because they had knowledge. So they, they often wouldn't kill them, but make them you know, navigate. Um, and in the case of the Huguenots, um, they, they worked with, um, in Panama, with the Cimarroons who were escaped slaves who had set up a community in Panama. Um, so in that case, they, were, they joined forces against the Spanish. Yeah, and, and William Gustus Bowles, uh, we actually, I said that, you know, parents usually don't write down what they, what they did. In this case, he actually did. And that's because he, he tried to form his own country. Um, and he basically started issuing commissions to these ships to go out and start attacking the Spanish in 1790s, early 1800s. And on one of those ships, they actually had a logbook. And they're later captured, and they're tried in Cuba. And as the evidence, they used to try them was the logbook that the captain actually uh, kept with them. But what's very interesting is they list the individuals on board that ship White, black, as well as indigenous people were on board that vessel. On board his, it was called the Tostanoke, which is um, I probably pronounced it incorrectly, but that means warrior in Scogie language, uh, because he he had uh, built his you know career really on uh, allying with the indigenous people in the southeast and kind of being this uh, uh, trade merchant essentially um, for that for this area for all of the southeast. Diverse crews, you certainly get diverse crews. I had a uh, question. I wondered if USA or uh, over in Pensacola, if y'all have done any uh, searching in uh, Perdido Bay, the Lost Bay, where they, the entrance kept changing on the Gulf. They would have to search for it. I've heard a lot of people say the, the pirates came in and hid the gold in the hills. And, yeah. You know, I want to go look. <laughs> I, I can follow. I got a good story about that. Yeah. We have not. Yeah, yeah we have not either. Uh, we most of, we have done a lot of work in some of the rivers, Blackwater River in particular. We are at the University of West Florida. We're one of only a handful of underwater archaeology programs in the entire country. I think there's like four or five, something like that. And you're the only one who is close to water. We're close to so water. Yeah, yeah Texas A&M is have, like way out there. Yeah. yeah. Indiana, I think, has one. It's like maybe have one. But uh, they're great. They're all great. But UWF is awesome. Um, and so they've spent a lot of time looking in uh, Blackwater River, Pensacola Bay. Um, they have looked for uh, a privateer, or what used to be a privateer ship, called Who's Afraid. And it eventually, it was captured by the British Navy during the American Revolutionary War. And then uh, they actually, when, before the Spanish were going to actually come and uh, lay siege to Pensacola, uh, towards the end of the American Revolutionary War, the captain sent the ship up to Blackwater Bay and the Blackwater River. And it, capsized in storm. So they, they've been looking for that for, for a number of years. Uh, but now they, we haven't spent a lot of time in the Perdido River uh, really doing any sort of underwater survey. It would be interesting to, to do that. Um, and it's, you know, I'm sure there's there's stuff in there, but I can tell you the whole buried treasure thing is all made up. That is Robert Louis Stevenson's imagination. Uh, there are, I think, only two recorded incidents of pirates burying treasure. One of them, they lied about, probably lied about it, and the other one, they came back and got it. Um, and I love, I love the story of, uh, anybody read Treasure Island? Yeah. So, at the end of this story, right, so it's, it's you know, this kid, and this guy shows up at his tavern, and he's like, obviously like a pirate, and he's got this, ends up having this treasure map, and they get a hold of it, and they decide, like, we're going to go find this treasure and this treasure map. And they get a crew together, and it turns out, like, half the crew are actually pirates that had served with this pirate who had buried this treasure. Anyway, so they go to the treasure, they go to this island, and they eventually, when they find it, they dig it up. Guess what? It's not there. <laughs> it's not there! The guy had already been found, and he, and he put it away in a cave. The guy who had been marooned on the island had already found it. Sorry if I'm spoiling the story for you. But, but my point is that even the, the, the origin of the, the myth of buried pirate treasure, even in the story, the treasure wasn't there because someone came back and got it. Right? So that wasn't typical among pirates at all. I mean, that's, that's just one of those things that over time has just become mythologized in popular media. You know, so many, uh, the story of Billy Bullock and Jose Gaspar, there's, you know, these 
fictional pirates that we celebrate as festivals now, they, they have all those elements in them. But it really comes from Robert Louis Stevenson. It's, it's not something that we see archeologically. Um, it's not something that we see even in the documents. We have lots of lists of stuff that pirates stole, especially privateers because they had to auction that stuff off. The court records are full of like, they literally put an inventory of everything they stole and brought. And it's not gold and silver, it's like goods. Uh, sometimes it's people, sometimes it's enslaved people. Logs, furs. Um, yeah, stuff that probably won't survive archaeologically, in the, you know, organic materials, it's buried uh, in underwater. Um, they couldn't use it if they were burying it. They right. They couldn't make anything off of it. Right. It. Yeah, I have, I have a good story about, I, I got a call a couple years ago from, there's, there's two different channels, there's a travel channel, I think National Geographic, and they st one of them has a show called uh, Pirates of the Caribbean or something like that. It's one of Jacques Cousteau's sons or daughters or something, it's like the host. And there's another one through National Geographic, and they were doing story, one was doing a story about, you know, Jose Gaspar, and is this real? And then the other one was, at the same, at the same time, was doing something, they were like, we want to maybe do something about Billy Bowlegs, and so, uh, for some reason, they contacted me, the, the producers, and so they, they asked me, you know, is any of this, is this true? And I said, no. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's not. I, but I told them, like, but, but you could maybe do this instead. And one thing that I had mentioned is that um, uh, there, there is some truth. You know, when we look at the 1820s in that time period, there is a lot of history here and a lot of fascinating stuff. William Augustus Bowles is really a fascinating story that really hasn't been told uh, as well as it should be. Um, so I, they said, okay, and I, I met with them, and then I didn't hear anything from them. And then a year later, the show comes out, and they're, they're up exploring pretty near river, looking for some very pirate treasure in a Native American mound. It's probably a burial mound, right? And they're like metal detecting, probably on state lands. So, <laughs> so sometimes, you know, they're gonna go to whatever they think, like the general public is gonna be more entertained by. And, and it, it, it tends to promote those you know, things that have been really our myth um, that we all kind of just associate with pirates because because we're all the students. It's like So I have to wear your shirt. You know, I grew up in the 80s, you know, so like Indiana Jones and the Goonies. I think I love this movie. But yeah, uh, they did just, although they did just find, I, I never knew this, but apparently Goonies, uh, the movie, is actually based on uh, a ship that wrecked along the coast of Oregon, I think in the 1600s, in a colonial time period. But uh, they recently announced, uh, a large uh, archaeology firm called Search announced that they believe they had found some of the timbers from the actual, from the actual yeah. wreck. So it's actually based in some, you know, something that actually happened. It was nothing to do with pirates. Um, and people often associate shipwrecks with piracy, but most shipwrecks that we find have nothing at all to do with pirates. And it's very difficult to, to identify. And I want to add before another question is that a lot of people ask archaeologists, oh, did you find any gold? Like, you know, when we're out. And we do not find gold because people take gold with them. We're interested in what people, you know, what they use every day in their daily life and the things that we find their trash. Um, we don't find any gold, typically. Maybe a coin here and there if we're lucky. Hmm. Is any of stuff tied to Oak Island series or anything? <laughs> that, no, the ones that I talked to were not. Uh, I think that's History Channel. Um, yeah, I, I don't watch that show, and there's a lot of historians that have, have you know, given their take on it. Yeah. And it, it. There was something that happened there, but it's like every week it changes to something else, which is like okay, you know, it's the Templars one week, and then it's the Romans the next, and then so you know that's not a, a very sound. Um, scientific method of doing that. But it's, it's entertainment, right? You know, I, I guess it's entertainment. But yeah, I, I haven't personally uh, been involved in any of that. Yes, sir. Would, would you say in your research that you found that um, partnerships were egalitarian and kind of democratic, or was kind of a mix, or what would you say about that? Yeah, so th this, that's the debate, right? Um, God, what's, what's his name? Trying to think of the historian that we all cite all the time. Redeker. Redeker, Marcus Redeker. Yeah, that was his big thesis, right? It was like social egalitarian. Um, so yes and no 
in, in my research. And, and there's more recent scholarship that's kind of challenging Marcus Redeker's, you know, his, his thesis that he's put out there. Um, yeah, I, cer I certainly, you see that. You, you see that, on, at least certainly in the, in the uh, early 18th century, or early 19th century, late 18th century, that there's a tendency to be sort of democratic, that they're, that they're dividing the, the captured and the prizes a little bit more equally, although that's not always the case. Jean Lafitte didn't, right? He went with more of the privateer um, contracts, which weren't as egalitarian at all. Um, so, so yeah, you, you, I do see some of that. Um, I think the question is like, why? Right? Is it because, of, like Marcus Redeker says, it's like this like proto egalitarian socialism, you know, microcosm that's being created, uh, that's rejecting kind of mainland society. More recently, historians have been looking at pirates from, and again, this is not my period, so this is other people's research, have looked at pirates from that time period and said, well, actually, they were like hanging out with the governors. You know, they, they had like land. Uh, they had families back on the land. Like they had lots of money. They they had assets. Um, they they weren't necessarily these egalitarian people that were sharing all the spoils. Um, so I, so I, yeah, I, I do see some similarities. But the question is why? Right? It, it it maybe is that unfortunately we can't interview them because they're dead and they didn't like write any of that down. Like why they were doing that specifically because nobody asked them, right? Um, or it could have just been practical. You have no legal recourse, right? If you're in a pirate ship and your captain rips you off, a sailor, if that happened to a sailor, you have some options. You could mutiny, but that's rare, incredibly rare to mutiny. Or you can do what most of them did, which is you're just, I'm, I'm leaving the ship next time we get to port. And then in other instances that was much more common was to actually sue them in court, which we have tons of court records for. Well, you're a pirate, you don't, you only have like one or two of those options. You jump ship or you mutiny, right? So, so it may have been the reason why they tended to be like that is because it was like almost like self-regulating, so they could not have to to turn to those other really extreme measures if someone felt like they had been wronged. But that's I mean that's a good question. I don't really know the answer, but but yeah, I do. I I have seen that certainly in the 19th century. Uh, I published an article a few years ago. Looking specifically at that, can we find what Redeker says in this later stuff? Basically, I say yes, yeah, you can to a, to a certain extent, but I didn't go as far as to say like, well, it's because they were proto-socialists, you know, or whatever. Question for both of you, uh, and this really isn't piracy, so forgive me, but uh, how do you interface with the treasure hunter? Like, for instance, yeah. who owns the Cotillo? This, uh, Does the state of Alabama have a claim to it? Yes. Or how, how do you do those? And, and the same, like, yeah, I, I can with speak the to Florida fishers. If you want to talk about yeah, Florida control. has very specific yeah. maritime law. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so the Cotillo, my understanding is that his state, they have to tie up to that. Um, in the state of, again, I'm not as familiar with Alabama, but I'm very familiar with Florida's um, uh, laws regarding its cultural resources. So in the state of Florida, anything that's on a navigable body of water, so you can throw a kayak on it one day of the year to create a river, some, some lakes, uh, large enough lakes and ponds, anything on the bottomlands is state sovereign land, state submerged land. And therefore, anything that's cultural, that's the state of Florida is considered 50 years or older, then it is property of the state. And so it's managed by the state. Um, and that also applies to the ocean. So in the Gulf of Mexico, I think it's, I always get the nautical miles off. Oh, it's many years. Yeah, it's, I think it's nine nautical miles it's off 12. in the Gulf. 12, yeah, 12 nautical miles in the Gulf. And then six or nine in the Atlantic. I can't remember, you can look it up. But all of that is also state submerged lands. So any wreck, that's located there is going to be state that's in anything archaeology related. Uh, beyond that, you have economic exclusion zones, and this, that's federal. Um, but then also it will depend on the ship, right? So the ships that we have in Pensacola Bay the, from the 1559 Lina fleet, technically that's still the property of Spain through treaties that we have. That was a royal 
uh, expedition that was funded by the Spanish crown. And so they never gave title away from those wrecks. So they, they own that. And that's, um, those laws, a lot of those laws came out of like Mel Fisher, you know, the, those issues that they had, um, that those laws didn't exist at the time that, that Mel Fisher was doing his work. Um, but, but now they, they do exist. Uh, any naval wreck, any military craft, sunken craft, those are also, doesn't matter where you find those, even in international waters, through treaties, those are still the property of, of the military. So naval ships, for example, airplanes, still the property of the military. So it would be illegal to, uh, without a permit, to remove those. Now Florida does have salvage. They, you know, they have salvage permits that have kind of been grandfathered in. They, they don't really give those out anymore, um, or they don't give those out. There are still a few of those out there that have just kind of been grandfathered in. Um, but those, again, are, are have the areas that they've had those permits for, at this point, it's been many, many decades. Of, so every once in a while, you'll, you'll see a report of them finding something, but it's pretty rare at this point. Um, What's Alabama doing? So Alabama is much the same, much the same, yeah. Um, and But off the coast of Florida, they a salvager actually has located Rabot's ship. Um, and the state has has had to intervene in that in that instance. Yeah. Um, and then there's also you know France has some rights to it yeah, still too. Yeah. So yeah, it's still the property of France. And what this property. does is it it really it, it inhibits research and getting the findings out to the public. So that was found I don't know five years ago. Yeah. And years. and we still haven't so, seen yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. But we do work with I mean. Obviously, there's there's a shared interest, right? I mean, people that are treasure hunters are obviously have some interest in, in history and archaeology. So we, we do try to bring as many people in as we can just to do it the proper way. Uh, we've done that uh, through things like our citizen science projects by monitoring archaeological sites. We do that through our public archaeology lab, um, you know, working in. And some of these, you know, some of these treasure hunters are, are very knowledgeable. We work with metal detectorists. There's a great program out of Montpelier that they work with metal detectorists um, all the time out there. And as long as it's done in the proper way with the proper training and the proper oversight, ethically, it can be incredibly beneficial. Um, the problem is, and it, a lot of the times, usually it comes down to you know, taking ownership of the artifacts. And that's just something that archeologists uh, cannot do ethically because they don't belong to us. Um, they, they belong to the communities and where they came from. Uh, they belong to the de descendants. Um, so that's, that's where it gets, I think, sometimes more difficult in that relationship. But there are, there are some really good examples of collaboration uh, and, and working together. And so um, I'm always for collaborating as, as long as it can be done in, a, in an ethical way. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. OK, so um, I noticed that you had a few documents from the Bahamas, and I was curious to inquire about, um, are there yeah. other ports in the Caribbean that played a major role in privateering and in, in piracy? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, Port Royal was a big one, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was San Domingue, right. uh, what's now Haiti, um, particularly after the Haitian Revolution mm -hmm. in the early 1800s was a hotbed of activities. And there are accounts of entire crew members being people of African descent on these pirate vessels. Um, Cuba, the north end of Cuba was a major hotbed. Uh, Yucatan Peninsula was also a hotbed. Uh, Trinidad, St. Bart's was also notorious, although it was, you know, by, by the time period that I'm looking at, it was, it was a Swedish colony. Um, but they were notorious for kind of looking the other way. They, you know, they were all for free trade. They didn't care how you brought the stuff in, how you got it. They were all for it. So yeah, a lot of the Caribbean islands down there um, throughout different time periods were, were major activities. But I'd say uh, San Domingue especially, and Haiti, and then Church Yeah, and, and you know, all of the Spanish ports, um, you know, the, the French were after. Um, they were bringing all of this gold from Mexico. Um, and I, I was thinking about, when you asked your question about the gold, you know, Drake had 100,000 pounds uh, worth of gold, um, so I don't think you'd have to be egalitarian. Like everybody's going to get their share off this, you know, you know, Spanish fleet. So 
Um, in that case, I don't, I don't think that they were, but I have no idea. Um, you know, it se seems to me like they would have been very stratified, um, just like society at the time. One more question is what Stuart says we have time for. I was hoping the tires over here would go down. <laughs> Yeah, you need to at least get on camera where we're referencing you. People are like, what are they talking about? He is, he is dressed as a pirate, 100%. Yeah, that's right. for, the, for the people who are watching this online or wherever they're going to see this, if, if you don't show up on camera, he looks legit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Come on out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, hello there. Uh, yeah, perfect. Excellent. How's everybody doing tonight? <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm not a part of it. <laughs> you are now, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Oh, I did want to mention one thing. So if you want more, if you like piracy and archaeology, there's actually a couple different volumes of books about the archaeology of piracy. It's through the University of Pre University Press of Florida. There's two volumes. First one called is called X Marks the Spot. And the other one is called Pieces of Eight. And there's a third one coming out in 2023. I got a co-chapter in it. So just, you know, bye. <laughs> I won't make any money off of it, but, but it's, it's gonna be another great addition to those two volumes. But if you haven't read those, uh, I highly recommend both of those. They're excellent research of um, all the articles and they're uh, fantastic and there's there's more to come. So uh, if you read those, just wait until 2023, you'll have another one. Where, where are those titles again? So the first one, they, I forget what year it came out, early 2000s, called X Marks the Spot okay. by Ewan, E-W-E-N, he's an editor, and Skullcroft. And then the second one, same editors, is called Pieces of Eight. And the, the third one, and they, they've told me 2023 is a reach for that, it's called Dead Man's Chest. They're going to like run out of terms eventually. <laughs> and those are the go-to for the archaeology of piracy. And what I love about them is they're very accessible. Anybody, you don't have to be an archaeologist, could pick those up and understand. Um, they're very they're very readable. They're yeah. good reads. Yeah. And I, I should mention that the chapter I, I, I co-wrote it with a colleague of mine, Jess Craig, who wanted to be here tonight, but unfortunately she couldn't be here tonight. So. But yeah, well, thank you so much. It's been great. I always love coming down to Golf Quest and downtown Mobile is awesome. So thanks yeah. for having us. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having us. It was great doing this presentation yeah. with Mike because we had um, grad school classes way back in the day together. So this is really cool. Yeah. Thank